here on Valley Drive in Florence, bought televisions. Oh, were we, we thought we were just amazed with all the, the uh, things that were on. It didn't start till four in the afternoon. But, but then they came on and had programs that were all about the Wild West. I mean, there was Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett, thanks to Walt Disney. And um, we just were so excited to learn about all those homesteaders that were captured by the Native Americans and what happened to them. And there were a number of stories and a uh, series about that. So when I learned that our speaker tonight, Tom Stro Strofeld, was, uh, had, had created a book, had written a book that dealt with the abduction of a young boy named Stephen Ruddle, right here in Kentucky. And he was taken off to live with the Shawnee. Wow, that really piqued my interest, Tom, right away. And I'm so glad you came to tell us all about the book you've written and the story. Welcome. <laughs> all right, let's welcome him. Well, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd like to thank you for coming out tonight. And I think where I want to begin is by asking you, how many of you grew up around here? And by that, I mean, let's say an 80-mile radius of here. Well, we're pretty uniform in that. But, you know, I remember when I was a little boy, I was always intrigued by the frontier and by the past. And I would say to my, my folks, um, were there any frontiersmen here? <clears throat> they said, no, no, that was all down in Tennessee like David Crockett. I said, hmm. I said, well, how about Indians? They said, no, that was all out west, like Sitting Bull. And I said, golly, nothing good ever happened here. I said, this has got to be the most boring place, uh, you know, an individual could possibly ever be. And then as I went along and did a little reading and received a little education, I came to realize that people all over the world that are interested in the legendary figures of the frontier, whether it be uh, David Crockett, uh, Simon Kenton, Daniel Boone, Tecumseh, Lewis Wetzel, you name it, um, necessarily are concerned with southwestern Ohio, northern and central Kentucky, southeastern Indiana, because this is where it was all going on. And I felt a little better when that happened. Um, in 1968, 67, I beg your pardon, I was walking through uh, the old Chilitos and saw a stack of books in that mezzanine place where they used to have the bookstore. And there was a book standing on end, and on its dust cover there was depicted a frontiersman, as we understood them back in those days. He had the fur cap and the fringed buckskin coat and the big knife and the Kentucky rifle with the brass patch box and all the stuff that we know is a click off of accurate nowadays, but back then that's what we thought it was. And I picked it up and began thumbing through it. I was majoring in English and history over at the university. And the thing I liked about it was he had footnoted all the events in the book and if he described a battle, he would say, um, site of present Russellville, Ohio, site of present Maysville, Kentucky. And that became a treasure map to me because for me it was nothing like the thrill of standing right on the spot where something happened. And so my sweetheart of the time, who later became my wife, and I, every weekend we would hop out there and we'd go visit one of these places and I'd, I'd gain an understanding of what the terrain was like and how, what the distances were like and I start to get a handle on the whole thing. Um, J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings, declared that stories become myths and myths become legends. And I think that's pretty good. I think that just accurately describes 
the way the things of our past recede and recede and recede. But the era that we are concerned with, the 1700s, um, is still within the period of stories, not myths. But when we reach backwards, we're grasping at straws. And we, we have only the physical evidence and the documentary evidence. That's it, because the past is gone. Now, the physical evidence consists of things that have come down in museum collections, uh, been recovered by archaeologists, been cared for in uh, the, the collection of uh, people who like uh, the weapons or the artifacts of that period, and so we have them to look at. I brought a few things to suggest the spirit of the times. This is a war club, and even in the age when both sides were fighting with firearms and with uh, steel weapons, some people, and Tecumseh in particular, preferred the war club. I should point out that in the Iliad, the Greek giant Ajax also fought with a club while the rest of them were using uh, 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 bronze swords, but a mighty man was he and he could wield that thing, you know. And you didn't have to reload a war club, you just knock him in the head and kept on going. So that was an alternative weapon that was used. I'm sure you've heard of the custom of scalping. Ken Hamilton made this for me. It's an exact copy of the cheap scalping knives that were exported from Birmingham and Sheffield to this country. Ken's dad was a museum director and he's an obsessive relic hunter and an exact reproducer of the artifacts of the period. Every little squiggle is perfect in his work. Um, I've only ever seen one human scalp and it's in the Maysville Museum. Um, interesting because the scalp is about that thick, which surprised me. I thought it would be paper thin. And the, the, the most remarkable thing about this artifact is it's not the scalp of a white man that was taken by an Indian, it's the scalp of an Indian that was taken by a white man. And I assure you this mutilation of dead enemies was commonplace on both sides in the Indian Wars. However, the better order of men would not allow those under their command to do it. And we'll, we'll see some of that in the account that I'm going to read to you. So there was humanity and even nobility at the highest levels, both among the indigenous peoples, among our people. But there were other people who were just bloodthirsty, angry over the loss of some relative, and held an inveterate hatred of the, uh, of the indigenous, and, and they never missed a chance, as they would have said. Oh, one more thing to show you. This is a wampum belt, and it's made out of shells. The purple are rarer than the white, and so they're used to embellish it. When the Indian orators would talk, they'd stand and drape the belt over their arm like this to emphasize it. And such belts were used to solemnize treaties. Usually they weren't as large as that one. That's a copy of the treaty belt uh, that the Delaware gave William Penn to solemnize their agreement in Pennsylvania. Usually the wampum exchange was two or three strands. But this was sacred among them as a point of honor. And if you wanted to rescind an agreement, you couldn't do it unless you returned the wampum to the tribe that had given it. To not do so or to be unable to do so was to dishonor yourself among all the native peoples. I've said that there were two routes to understanding these times and that the material culture was one of them. Most of my life I had the pleasure and privilege of working as a museum curator, and so my job was handling these objects 
and trying to figure them out, trying to figure out what kind of guy could make such a thing, what kind of guy wanted to own such a thing, and every little wiggle and squiggle becomes significant in the study of long rifles, in the study of furniture, architecture, any of the decorative arts from the 18th century speak in a language that we have to learn all over again because we forgot. Well, in addition to the physical evidence, as I've said, the documentary evidence is the other equally valuable way that we have of understanding the past. And I want to clarify that to the best of my ability. There, they, the evidence is of two types. There are the pictures, or if you like the big word, the iconography of the period, which means the maps and the prints and the portraits and the other images, which are, are valuable from a variety of standpoints. First, they kind of show us how these people saw themselves, how they wanted to be represented. And uh, I love them for that reason. Second and equal to the iconography is the primary source material. This is the words of those who lived it, right from the horse's mouth. And anybody who commands any respect as a historian will settle for nothing less. You have to be able to run this down to a primary source or else it's taken with a grain of salt. And we have we have some very good novelists, historical novelists among us. My personal favorite was Kenneth Roberts, who wrote before World War II. He wrote um, Northwest Passage and Arundel, and a uh, wonderful writer, I thought. Um, I met um, Alan Eckert. I've followed some of his work. Um, I like his prose style, and as a popular popularizer, of this time in history, I don't think he can be beat. I do think there are occasions when he could have done his homework a little better, but far be it from me to criticize him. I simply think that he is one more of the very good authors that has looked at this period. Um, Jim Tom, I know pretty well, and he's written several books, Follow the River and uh, Tecumseh, and. Jim's a lovely guy. He's, he's married to the sister of the chief of the Shawnee Remnant Band, Dark Rain. And you go up to him and you think, oh yeah, this guy looks like a writer. He's got the tweed jacket and the turtleneck and the, the whole thing. Now, Jim was a Marine and he's no cream puff, but his prose style is, is a little on the tender-hearted side, a little on the super sentimental side. And I think maybe he's trying to engage the spirit of the times by doing that. But nevertheless, I have great respect for him as a writer, and I think he's very good. But no matter which one of these guys you like, the first thing I do is flip to the back and look for those footnotes. And I'm saying, where'd that guy get this stuff? Well, when I began running down Alan Eckert's footnotes, which was where I began, a great many of the citations were of a book called Simon Kenton by Edna Kenton. So I had to have a copy, and I went to a rare bookstore and bought one for too much money. And um, um, she apparently was a linear descendant of that gentleman himself, lived in New York City, had written a number of books on other subjects, but this, this kind of was her magnum opus to write the thing on her, on her uh, ancestor and it is good and it is also very well documented and points out where she got her material. Finally I figured out that the vast majority of true primary source material was coming from a collection called the Draper Papers in the, in the Wisconsin Historical Society. Dr. Draper was interested in writing a book about Daniel Boone just after that gentleman had died, back in horse and buggy days, and he reasoned the way to do the best possible job of that was to correspond with or visit everybody living who had known 
Daniel Boone himself and get their accounts of him. So he started out on this and he took notes and he took notes and he found that those who knew uh, Boone knew Kenton. Those who knew Kenton knew Simon Gurdy. Those who knew Simon Gurdy knew Lewis Wetzel, Tecumseh, etc., etc. And he kept writing. Never did publish his book on Daniel Boone. But by the time he was a middle-aged man, he had written 1,357 linear feet of notes on taken from interviews with the pioneers. Now, if you can picture 1,300 feet of typing paper laid on edge, you begin to see what a voluminous collection this was. Wisconsin Historical Society heard about it, and they wrote to him, and they said, uh, how'd you like to be the director up here? He said, well, what do I have to do? They said, not much, just bring your papers with you. <laughs> so he took that sinecure, took them up there, and that's the repository. Now, D Draper's notes are pure gold, and they have been sorted into collections, the Simon Kenton papers, the Daniel Boone papers, the Tecumseh papers, but they have never been transcribed because Dr. Draper has handwriting worthy of a pharmacist. It is, I happen to have a microfilm reader at home and I've got buddies at the Maysville Museum that'll loan me the microfilm for a month and then I have to take it back. But you bring it home and you can look at one page of Draper's notes for a half an hour before you transcribe it. But what comes off of there is golden. And so that's where the account I'm going to share with you today comes from. This is taken from Dr. Draper's interview with Stephen Ruddle. Ruddle Station was down here not too far from Cynthiana on a fork of the Licking. And the British, toward the end of the Revolutionary War, were getting a little worried about how much land the young, they, they were pretty sure they were going to lose but they didn't want to concede any more land than they had to to the young United States. Unfortunately for them, fortunately for us, and a very intrepid young man by the name of George Rogers Clark had taken 180 men in boats from Louisville, called the Falls of the Ohio at that time, down to the old French Fort Massac, walked a, um, a little over 100 miles overland and surprised them at Kaskaskia and took the fort. Dispatched Colonel Montgomery up the river who took Cahokia and the young United States now could lay claim all the way to the Mississippi River. This would be good at the treaty table. Well, the English said this, this will not do and they dispatched Henry Hamilton who was the commandant of Detroit to come south and uh, um, defend uh, Vincennes. Clark came back, captured Hamilton, and took him down to Williamsburg where he lay in chains. All this though takes place a few years later than the episode I want to talk to you about. This is in the early 1770s. Clark was in 1778. Um, Byrd and a cannon and Indians and Canadians and quite a host about 150 men came south to the mouth of the Licking opposite the mouth of the Licking River, Cincinnati. Came across and they went right down what we call Route 27, as I recall, that parallels the Licking River down as far as Falmouth. Now you may be sitting there thinking that guy's talking through his hat. He has no idea where Bird came into Kentucky. But John Filson published a map of Kentucky in 1784, and on there he draws a dotted line right along the Licking River with the legend Bird's War Road. Bird had a six-pounder cannon with him. That shoots a ball about this size. It's big enough to knock down the gate of a log stockade. He wheeled his cannon up outside uh, Ruddle Station. He said, I demand your surrender. They said, we will not surrender. He said, well, he said, if you, if you surrender now, I will give you terms. 
and assure you that you will not be molested by my Indians. But if I have to knock the gate down and you surrender at discretion, I won't be responsible for what happens to you. And they know, knew, all knew exactly what that meant, massacre. So they did surrender, and it was at that time that Stephen Ruddle, who was a boy of eight, was captured by the Shawnee and carried back up into Ohio to their village of Chillicothe. That's, that's not the one we call Chillicothe, or uh, at the mouth of the Scioto. Uh, Indian Chillicothe was between Xenia and Yellow Springs in a beautiful bend of the Little Miami River. I'd say there's about a thousand acres on that plain with a gentle hill where the council house used to stand. I wonder how many of you have ever seen a picture of an Ohio Indian or any local Indian from that period. Anybody? I'd be surprised. This is Tecumseh. This is his brother, the Shawnee prophet, or in Shawnee, Lolala Wasika. And I have to tell you, the first time I saw these pictures, I thought those guys look like Mexicans. Because I had Mexican friends who came from Oaxaca, and I know the features. Well, there's a good reason for that. The Shawnee word for their people is Shawandasi, and it translates South Wind people, because their original home was near Lake Chapala. That's about 100 miles west of Mexico City, near Monterey. But the Aztecs became so fierce on them back in early times that their leader, Little Fog, decided that they had better leave all that territory and head north and try to find a new settlement. So they went overland to Yucatan, where everybody likes to take vacations now. And at that point, uh, Little Fog divided the tribe in half, one half going by sea, one half going by land, and they reunited in Florida. Yucatan, by the way, was, I should tell you how the name came about, the Spaniards asked the Mayans, pardon me, what is the name of this place? They said, Yucatan. Well, in Maya, that means, I don't know, that the name stuck, and so it's still called Yucatan to this day. They reunited in Florida. They went up through Carolinas and came west through southwest Virginia, Kentucky, on up into Ohio, and settled with the remnants of the Hopewell people at the location we call Fort Ancient. It's kind of a misnomer because the Fort Ancient culture was 1,200 years before uh, the Hopewell people occupied that hill fort there. But nevertheless, that's the name we give it. And the Shawnee people of today trace their ancestry to that place and to those people. Now, after that lengthy preface, I want to get into Stephen Ruddle's account. Tecumseh was born in the neighborhood of Old Chillicothe. That's the one I was telling you about. In the year 1768, he was of the Kispoko tribe of the Shawnee Indians. The Shawnees were divided like the Israelites into 12 tribes, and with the exception of the Makocha tribe, the chiefs owed their power and authority to their merit. But the tribe just mentioned had a king over them whose authority was hereditary. In other words, in the majority of Shawnee clans, you had to distinguish yourself in battle in order to become chief, but if you were a Makocha, if your father's a chief, you become the chief. Tecumseh's father was a great war chief and fell at the head of his tribe at the Battle of the Mouth of the Kanawha between the whites and Indians. His uh, Shawnee name was Puksinwa, which means hard striker. And the battle that they're referring to is the Battle of Point Pleasant in Lord Dunmore's War in 1774. That was the first big fight where the Virginia riflemen and the indigenous people 
came together. And it's said that they were about even in numbers, about 150 to a side, and they fought all day without either side gaining the advantage until it began to grow dusk and the whites prevailed, drove the Indians back across the uh, river. Great psychological victory because Andrew Lewis and his boys did all of that from southwest Virginia. Lord Dunmore was circling around the long way and he came down within a couple of days and then they went up onto the Pickaway Plains of Ohio to force the Shawnee to capitulate, which they did. Hoxinwell was a man highly respected among the tribe, both as a statesman and warrior. At his dying moment, he called to him his son, a youth of 12 or 13 years, named Pepquahannock, or Gunshot, and strongly enjoined him to preserve unsullied the dignity and honor of his family, and directed him in future to lead forth to battle his younger brothers. <clears throat> Agreeably to the instructions of his father at his death, he took upon himself the education of his brothers and he used every means to instill into the mind of Tecumseh correct, manly, and honorable principles, leading him forth himself to battle and instructing him in warfare. He, was, he taught him to look with contempt upon everything that was mean. He used frequently to take Tecumseh, and they alone would go and commit depredations on their enemies when they were mere boys. I first became acquainted with Tecumseh at the age of 12 years, and being the same age as myself, we became inseparable companions. They used to wrestle and fight in the snow and um, conduct sham battles. He says Tecumseh was always remarkable from his boyhood up for the dignity and rectitude of his deportment. There was a certain something in his countenance and manners that always commanded respect and at the same time made those about him loving. During his boyhood, he used to place himself at the head of the youngsters and divide them when he would make them fight sham battles in which he always distinguished himself by his activity, strength, and skill. He was a great hunter and in that was remarkable, would never if he could avoid it hunting in parties where women were. He was very free-hearted and generous to excess, always ready to relieve the wants of others, Whenever he would return from a hunting expedition, he would harangue his companions and made use of all his eloquence to instill into all their minds honorable and humane sentiments. Now, he rarely ever drank ardent spirits to excess, but when inebriated, he was widely different from the other Indians, perfectly good-humored and free from those savage ideas which distinguished his companions and always reproving them for their folly. He was by no means savage in his nature, always expressed the greatest abhorrence when he heard of or saw acts of cruelty or barbarity practiced. From his earliest days, he was remarkably easily awoke out of sleep. He was always on the alert, and it was impossible to take him by surprise. He was always adverse to taking prisoners in his warfare, but when prisoners fell into his hands, he always treated them with as much humanity as if they had been in the hands of civilized people. No burning, no torturing, never tolerated the practice of killing women and children. He was a man of great courage and great conduct, perfectly fearless of danger. He always inspired his companions with confidence and valor. He never evinced any great regard for the female sex. It was a custom among Shawnees to marry as many wives as they pleased. Tecumseh had at various times a wife, which he did not keep very long before he parted with her. He had a Cherokee squaw who lived with him the longest of any other. The women were very fond of him, much more than he was of them. He was a very jovial companion, fond of cracking his jokes, but his wit was never aimed to wound the feelings of his companions. The first engagement in which he particularly <coughs> distinguished himself was an attack on some boats coming down the Ohio, he being then about 15 years old. 
the boats were taken and all the persons on board were killed in the action, Tecumseh behaved with great bravery and even left in the background some of the oldest and bravest warriors. Now this was at the mouth of the Big Miami and the boat was a group of troops coming down, led by Colonel Loffrey, coming down to um, add their strength to George Rogers Clark at Louisville who was getting ready for another campaign. They got bushwhacked there at the mouth of the Big Miami. Tecumseh was there, James Gertie, who was Simon Gertie's brother, was there. Um, oh, Mohawk, what's his name? Joseph Brandt was there as well. In the action, one prisoner, as well as I recollect, was taken, and the Indians proceeded to burn him. And after it had been done, Tecumseh, who had been a spectator, expressed great abhorrence of the deed. And finally, it was conceded among them not to burn any more prisoners that should afterwards be taken, which was ever after strictly adhered to by him. These boats were taken in the spring, and in the fall they moved toward the south on an expedition against the whites. On the route to the south, Tecumseh's horse fell with him and broke his thigh, which confined him until spring following, when the party headed by Tecumseh's oldest brother proceeded on their expedition. He was then able to walk with the assistance of crutches, and his brother endeavored to persuade him to remain behind, but he could not be prevailed on to comply. They had several engagements with the whites in this expedition, which kept them absent from home three years. Tecumseh always distinguished himself. It was on this expedition that his oldest brother fell in an attack on some fort, the name or situation of which I cannot now tell. This was on the Cumberland, just south of Nashville, and his eldest brother's name was Chicksica. Uh, the party was chiefly composed of Cherokees, a few days before they attacked the fort, this oldest brother harangued the party and told them on such a day and at such a time of the day they would arrive at the fort, that they would attack the fort in the morning and would succeed if they would persevere in the fighting. That precisely at noon he would be shot through the center of his forehead. But when he related this, the Indians endeavored to persuade him to turn back which he refused to do. The attack was commenced, and as he had predicted, he received the shot in his head and fell, saying that his father had died gloriously in battle, that he considered it an honor to die in battle, and that it was what he wished, and did not wish to be buried at home like an old squaw to which he preferred that the fowls of the air should pick his bones. <laughs> Now this gift of prophecy ran through Tecumseh's family, and uh, each of you I'm sure has your own beliefs about intuition and precognition and so forth. His father um, had predicted his death at the Battle of Point Pleasant, and years after the episode we're talking about here, Tecumseh was trying to unite all of the tribes to become allies with the British in the War of 1812 as a last ditch effort to drive out the Americans. They thought they could do it if they could hold together. And he was everywhere. One week he was up on Lake Superior among the Ojibwe, over in the Finger Lakes country talking to the Five Nations, the Iroquois back down south to the Delaware, to the Cherokee. Finally, he's in Alabama, and he's talking to a bunch of Creeks. And he told him his story, and he said, I want you all to come to Prophetstown. My brother Prophet can see into the future. Now, it may be that Tecumseh was giving him these prophecies, or he may have had the gift, and we will never know. But one way or the other, he served as a Shawnee holy man and had united a good many people in that town. So he asked the Creeks to come join him. And he said, well, I don't know, Tecumseh, you know, uh, 
they haven't been too hard on us down here and we really haven't heard too much about what you can do and I think we'll just lay low for the time being. If, if, if you do something remarkable, we'll change our mind and come up and join you. Tecumseh said, do something remarkable. They said, yeah. He said, all right. He said, when I get back to my village, I will stamp my foot. And when I do, every house in this village will fall flat on the ground. They said, oh yeah, it probably will. Well, you go right ahead and then when that happens, we'll, we'll be right up. Well, he had foretold the earthquake of 1813. And the Mississippi ran backwards for four hours. Real Foot Lake was created in western Tennessee. And every house in Tukabashi was laying in sticks on the ground. Those Indians rolled up their blankets and grabbed their trade guns and <laughs> hightailed it up to Prophetstown to join Tecumseh. Well, back to our narrative. After his death, the party was dis disheartened. Now, this is the elder brother. Disheartened, and in spite of all, his exer all the exertions of Tecumseh, the Cherokees left the ground. Thus, they failed in their attempt. Tecumseh then told the party that he would not go home until he had done something to show for his good conduct. He accordingly took with him a small party of eight or ten, and a short time after attacked a family and perhaps killed the man and took the woman and children prisoners. I cannot recollect any of the particulars of the other engagements which occurred on this expedition. He was three times at night <coughs> beg your pardon, attacked in his encampment, but being remarkably watchful, he was always ready for the enemy and they seldom gained any advantage. He always examined with great care the ground upon which he encamped, no matter whether in the neighborhood or of the enemy or not, so that it was almost impossible to gain any advantage of him. During this expedition, he was attacked on the edge of a cane break, perhaps on the waters of Tennessee, while dressing some meat by a party of about 30 whites. He immediately ordered his small party to charge, and leading himself with the most determined bravery, he put the whole party to flight. Two whites were killed. At the expiration of three years from that time he left, from the time he left home, he returned. This was shortly after Harmer's defeat. He was not in St. Clair's defeat, being at that time on a hunting expedition and not having heard of the approach of St. Clair. This requires a little amplification. You may or may not know that the significance of Cincinnati is that it was the staging ground for every assault on the indigenous people in Ohio. Washington knew very well that the very next task of the United States was to subdue the Indians so they would allow settlement. Congress didn't have any money, but they had awarded bounty lands in Ohio primarily, some in Kentucky, some further on, Illinois, Indiana, uh, to the veterans of the Virginia troops. And these could not be settled as long as the Indians objected, which they did in the strongest terms. Harmer went up, they built Fort Washington, right, right about where the stadium is now, and about the size of the stadium. It was a huge installation. It was the biggest thing uh, that the United States had west of the Appalachian Mountains. And when they talked about the events out here, they didn't say the, the Western Army or St. Clair's Army. They said the Army of the United States is now proceeding north. St. Clair was in charge. He was Washington's good friend. He dispatched one of his subordinates, Harmer, and he said, go up there and show those Indians there's God in Israel. So Harmer went up thinking this would be a piece of cake, and the Indians did what Napoleon would call a Parthian defense. They would fall back, and the whites thought they hit them on the run. They'd fall back a little bit, regroup, fall back a little bit, regroup. Finally, the whites thought, well, these guys are cowards. They're not going to stand and fight. And they got a little more careless in their behavior. And the Indians had them right where they wanted, and they whacked them. And they defeated Harmer so bad that he turned the tail, ran back to Fort Washington in utter defeat. 
Washington said, this will not do. He said, we must have victory. And so he said, St. Clair, you go yourself and subdue these Indians. So St. Clair took an army of 1,500 men, uh, women, camp followers, uh, wives, washerwomen, other kind of women, um, artillery, droves of oxen, you name it. This, and this thing moved like a glacier, just slowly on up what we call Route 4 Springfield Pike now. Stopped in Hamilton and built Fort Hamilton where they put up that little cement uh, monument to the fort and then proceeded to establish a route going north. Well, the Indians thought that Parthian defense had worked so well the first time, they'd do it again. But they had greater numbers this time. It wasn't just the Shawnee, the uh, Miami had joined in as well. The Miami were commanded by Little Turtle, a great warrior, and the Shawnee were commanded by Blue Jacket, who despite Alan Eckert's book in play, was not an adopted white man. DNA tests have proven that he was born and raised a Shawnee. They finally fell on the whites, and in a later interview to Dr. Draper, Little Turtle himself told him, he said, I killed with my tomahawk that day until I could not raise my arm. It was just wholesale slaughter. And in a blind panic, that entire army went hightailing it back towards what is now Cincinnati, stopped for a little while in what we call North Side, it was Ludlow's station at that time, jumped into the Mill Creek and swam for their lives down to Fort Washington. It was the greatest defeat the United States Army had ever suffered, including all the battles of the Revolutionary War. Disaster. I think we have time to tell the denouement of this. Washington took another look at his generals. And there was one who was a renowned fighting man, but Washington didn't like him because he was also a renowned womanizer and a, a, a considerable alcoholic. Um, but he was so impetuous in battle that he had earned the nickname Mad Anthony Wayne. And Washington appointed him to command the troops. He assembled 10,000 men. That's the size of a Roman legion, so it was called Wayne's Legion. And they came down the Ohio, took a look around at Fort Washington. Wayne said, no. He said, too many women, too much alcohol. He said, we're going to keep on going, build a tent camp down here where the Mill Creek comes into the Ohio. That's where the football team practices now. And we're going to call it Hobson's Choice, or in other words, choice by default. And he drilled those men constantly until they knew the meaning of discipline. Then he had one other really good idea. He organized a corps of 40 mounted scouts. They would have been called spies at that time, headed by no less than William Wells and Simon Kenton, two of the most renowned Indian fighters on the frontier. They weren't going to get surprised again. They went north at a pretty slow pace with caution, but with their scouts ever out in front of them. Now the Indians observing them noticed that the majority of them were mounted troops. And so they looked for a place where the horses wouldn't be of any service. And they finally came to a place where a tornado would pass, pass through. All the trees had dropped together and created this tangle that today we call fallen timbers. Well, they had also drilled with the bayonet. And so while the horsemen couldn't fight, the infantrymen with bayonets came charging into the tangle, skewering the Indians, and finally sent them running. They defeated them. The English were trying to encourage the Indians against the Americans. They weren't very happy with the way the revolution came out. And so they were giving them arms, giving them ammunition, giving them encouragement. But they had sat down at the table at the Treaty of Paris and agreed not to give assistance, literal assistance, to the enemy. The Indians got back to this fort 
and the commandant dropped the bar on the front gate. Well, at that point, the Indians saw what British alliance was worth. They turned around, they came back to Wayne, and they said, we give up, we'll surrender. He saw it, he said, I'll tell you how this is going to go. He said, I'm, I'm building a fort at Greenville, where I want you to come next summer. But not just the Shawnee and the Miami. I want the Winnebago's, I want the Ottawa's, I want the Hurons, I want the Delaware, I want the Iroquois, I want every Indian in the whole network down there to capitulate and if they don't I'm going to come back up here and kill you all and they knew he could do it and indeed that next summer all of them came to the fort at Greenville the Treaty of Greenville was signed in 1795 and that ended Indian trouble in Kentucky and ended it for the most part in Ohio until the War of 1812 in Wayne's battle, he took a conspicuous part, or at least as much as the nature of the case would admit of. There he commanded a band of Shawnees. At the time the Indians um, commenced retreating, he together with two or three others rushed on a party of whites that had a field piece in charge, cannon, drove the artillerymen from their posts, cut loose the horses, mounted them and cleared themselves. Pretty nice little exploit. Now, I think we have time for one more episode here, which is really a good one. In April of 1793, a hunting party headed by Tecumseh were one night attacked by a party of men under Simon Kenton, the circumstances of which are as follows. In the day one of our party was out hunting up the horses, and being discovered by Kenton's party was shot. They put forward on his track, and on coming in sight of our camp, they discovered that we were unalarmed, and after making all the observations they wished, they returned back some distance, where they made their preparations for the attack. Tecumseh had laid down at night outside of the t camp or tents alongside of the fire. These were marquee tents they had taken from St. Clair's army, where we had been jerking some venison through the day. In the night, the attack was made by firing into the tents. Tecumseh sprang to his feet with his war club in his hand, a weapon which he invariably carried both in peace and war, hunting and battle. And calling to me, asked, Big Fish, where are you? Here I am, I said. Then you charge on that side, and I'll charge on this. And with that, he rushed on those on his side, knocked one in the head with his club, and drove the rest back. I, on my side, met a man as I came out of the tent, who I afterwards found out to be Kenton himself. I fired on him, but my gun, having gotten a little wet through the day, it blowed considerably, and at last just blowed out the ball without injuring Kenton, who had taken to his heels. Now, the flintlock works by the explosion of the black powder inside the barrel, expelling the ball with a great deal of force. If the powder gets wet, it doesn't explode, it sizzles. That's what happened, the ball came rolling out the barrel and didn't harm the enemy. I raised the Indian yell and called that they were running upon which the rest of the Indians in the tent who had remained silent sprang out and raising the war hoop, we run them off the ground. <coughs> Excuse me, this took place on either the waters of Little Miami or Brush Creek. Now, some other fellow was kind enough to leave a map of that battlefield in the Draper papers, which I have seen, and I've walked the ground, and it's right near the modern town of Williamsburg, Ohio, on the east fork of the Little Miami, should that be of any interest to you. We had 10 men, including the one killed in the morning. They had 28 men. Now this tells a sorry tale. What he's saying to us is nine Indians defeated 28 Kentuckians and ran them back home. But I have come across this account three or four times now. And even Kenton would say, unless they had them 
outnumbered at least two to one, preferably three to one. They'd rather not engage the Indians. To, this is a lovely sentence. Tecumseh was particularly attached to the war club. It was a weapon which he said had been used by his forefathers. Tecumseh wanted to embody the archetypal Indian warrior. And when he went into his last fight, he was, he was sick as a dog. He'd been shot. He was, had some disease. Um, he threw away all the white man stuff. He had been commissioned a brigadier general in the British Army. But he got rid of the scarlet coat, the sword, all of it, put on a simple buckskin blouse, took his war club, charged right up on Harrison, and was at that point killed. Um, a final addendum to this is that, as I told you, it was customary to take trophies from the bodies of the fallen enemy. And everybody, as we would say today, wanted a piece of Tecumseh, and this meant literally. Kent knew him, known him since he was a boy, and he couldn't bear the thought of Tecumseh being mutilated. Now there was another chief that had fallen, a Wyandotte by the name of Roundhead. He had a turban with ostrich plumes, five or six silver gorgets down the breast, elaborate quill work all over the buckskin blouse, all the ornamentation an Indian could bear. And Tecumseh said, yeah, there he is. And they looked at him and they said, oh yeah, that's a big chief. So they, they tore up Roundhead. And the story goes that that night the Shawnee people came back and took away the body of Tecumseh and have buried it in a secret place which they visit each year. I don't know if that's true or false. I, I hang around with some of those Redskins. There's a group called the um, Shawnee Remnant Band that meets up in Cincinnati. And two or three of them are friends of mine, but I'm a white man and they wouldn't tell me anything like that. In the fight, one of Tecumseh's party, a white man named jo Joseph Ward, who had been taken during Dunmore's War and had been raised by the Indians, was killed. Tecumseh and his party were compelled to give ground after fighting desperately, but he made out to carry off Ward, His company deserted him during that battle. He returned home, but not being pleased with an inactive life, he again went out to hunt and continued that in that employment um, until the Indians collected to give Wayne battle in the fall of 94. He was not engaged in any other battle or skirmish after that with Wayne during my continuance with the Indians. He was pleased with a piece of Greenville, said that now he was happy that he could pursue his hunting without danger. Well, as the saying partially goes, everybody that believes that stand on your head. But he would let this be said so that he could assemble the Indian tribes, meanwhile preparing them for a war against the whites. He had no children while I knew him. He was naturally eloquent, very fluid and graceful in his gesticulation, but not in the habit of using many gestures. There was no violence, no vehemence in his mode of delivering his speech. He always made a great impression on his audience. He was about five feet, 10 inches high, very well made, full of activity, and possessed of great strength. I know of no peculiarity about him that gained him popularity. His talents, rectitude of deportment, and friendly disposition commanded the respect of all about him. In short, I consider him a very great, as well as a very good man, who, if he had enjoyed the advantages of a liberal education, would have done honor to any age or any nation. Stephen Ruddle became um, prosperous in his old age. He moved to Missouri, became a judge, and was an esteemed elder of the community when Dr. Draper rode his buggy on out there across the Mississippi and interviewed him for this interview. And I do hope that you enjoyed hearing that account as much as I enjoyed presenting it to you. It's one of the really great ones.
Tom. That oh, real was pleasure. fascinating. I really enjoyed that. Well, go ahead. And, and uh, you have a, an extremely extensive knowledge of well, Indian people. You know, as my friends and I say, we've been marinating in this stuff for close to 50 years. Mm -hmm. And it's like I've been making the wine all my life, and now all I have, have to do is pour it. <laughs> well, that's excellent. We have really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. And this is really one of the special accounts. And, and is the book still available for sale? Well, this was not made into a book, but I do. I have written a book on Squire Boone, who was the first rifle maker of Kentucky. Um, it's been selling pretty well. The uh, um, professor emeritus of chemistry at Eastern Kentucky, or pardon me, Western Kentucky University in Elizabethtown just bought several copies and circulated it in the Boone family genial or newsletter because she's a member of that clan. So if anybody has an interest, please tell this lady and I'll get the contact information okay, to you all. Okay, great. That'd be great. Well, that's great. Um, again, thank you so much. We really enjoyed it. And if anybody's got any questions or wants to speak with uh, well, I love Tom, that. if anybody wants to know any more or yeah. has anything they'd like to take up with me, by all means, speak. Yeah, up. come and see him and, and yeah. talk to him. Our, my ancestors come at a bad time. They left Virginia in 1805. Yep. So that was about the time when everything was. What was their last name, sir? Well, B. Yeah. 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 But principally Germans and Scots Irishmen. That was the, that was the main stock. They couldn't speak English. Oh, they couldn't speak English. That's interesting. They arrived in So we got our 300-year anniversary coming up this year. That's right. That's good to have those stories come down and famous. Yeah. Has anybody else got a good family story they'd like to pass on? I, I ask that because I've received some of the best things I've ever heard just by asking the question. I will tell you one that came down in mind. My, uh, my mother's family uh, homesteaded up on the Wabash near Fort Wayne in the early 1800s when the last of Tecumseh's band was still up there. And her, I think it was third grade, uh, as a little boy, I used to play with the Indian boys, and their idea of fun was shooting out the flame of a candle with a bow and arrow. Now, I can do that with a flintlock, because when you shoot a flintlock, there's a whole bunch of wind that goes along with that ball. So if you're about within that radius of the wick, you'll, you'll snuff the candle. But with, a, with an arrow, you almost have to hit the wick to put it out, so they must have been very good indeed. Uh, that man's daughter, at a later date, um, was a little girl walking to town with her mother and they came upon a man standing on a stump speaking to a group of people much like um, yours truly and the little girl said mother what is that man doing and she said oh he's trying to get into elected into politics she said he's from Tennessee and his name's David Crockett <laughs> <laughs> that's great well, again, thank you so much, and if you have questions, please come see Tom. And meanwhile, we hope to uh, hear from you again sometime. Well, I do hope I have the pleasure of your company again. Yes, sir. I'm just curious, are, are there plans to publish the Draper Papers? The Squire Boone book? No, the Draper, the Draper Papers. Papers. You know, it would make the greatest, each one of those papers Sentence. would make the greatest master's thesis or even Ph.D., there is in the field of history, but it is just so tedious, nobody's taking the bull by the horns. And that's all up at the Wisconsin Historical Society? I've never been up there to see the originals, although my pals have. George Carroll's a dear friend of mine, and he was dean of history at Urbana College. Uh -huh. And he and another friend of mine went up there, and they've seen the original seen papers. But what I have seen are the microfilm photographs okay. of okay. those papers, and that that's... That's what I transcribed this from. I took okay. it from Draper's notes and, and typed it up. Great. Yeah. Oh, this was fascinating. Thank you again. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. See you all again.